Well, today is Sunday, historically referred to as, uh, by Christians as the Lord's Day. It is a weekly remembrance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's also uh, the 1st of April, which this year uh, marks uh, around the, the Western Hemisphere, at least, uh, at, the anniversary of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Our friends in the East will celebrate next week. It's also, like I said, the 1st of April, uh, April Fool's Day. And this is something that I know next to nothing about historically, but a little bit about when it comes to uh, pranks and jokes and things like that. I have indulged uh, my mischievous side on this day for some years. But I'm not doing so this morning. I'm not doing so in front of you. Uh, The message that I bring to you is not a joke. It's not a hoax. It's not a prank. And it's very important that we recognize that. At the center of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The cross is important, but the cross has no lasting meaning or significance apart from the resurrection. Unless, perhaps, it is a a cautionary tale of injustice against a misunderstood man or a nihilistic commentary on the inevitable failure of trying to make a difference. The mayor of London, in his Easter address, said that today we are commemorating the courage and compassion of Jesus. That seems to belie an understanding of Jesus that ends at the cross. A man who... Spoke truth to power, perhaps, and paid the ultimate price for it, but not one who came back from the dead. The efficacy of the cross, the power of the cross, is seen in the emptiness of the tomb. Jesus' death can only be good news because of the resurrection. Otherwise, it's just sad and depressing. And so I must make myself abundantly clear this morning. If you do not believe, one, that Christ died, but second, that Christ is risen, you are not a Christian. There is no meaningful Christianity apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is at the core of our faith. It is at the foundation of our faith. It is the very essence of our faith, of our being as followers of Jesus Christ. In our text this morning, which is Matthew chapter 28, please please turn there. Matthew chapter 28. There are two narratives One alleges essentially that the resurrection is man's prank. The other says it is God's power. Something very important to note when we read in just a moment. The tomb being emptied of Jesus' body is never called into question. Either by Jesus' friends or his enemies. Even atheist scholars today do not deny that the tomb was empty. The question is not whether Jesus' lifeless body could be found. The question is where it could be found and how. What became of the body? Either it was relocated or he is risen. Let's read from Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. 
For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and they did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Let's start by considering whether the empty tomb was man's prank. This line of thought suggests that Jesus really died and Jesus was buried. But that someone came at night and took his body away. You see it there in verse 11, where the the guards who were in front of the tomb ran back to the city and they said, uh, all that they had seen, this, this angel and the tomb is empty and what's going on? And they're told, here's some money, tell people they came and stole his body. We'll keep you out of trouble and it will, you know, it'll, it'll tidy all of this up because it's, it's most embarrassing, most problematic. In fact, if you were to go back into chapter 27, you would see that this was an event that they had anticipated, which is why there was a guard in front of the tomb in the first place. Verse 62 of chapter 27 says that the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And and Pilate says, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. And, and, and just those words intrigue me somewhat. Make it as secure as you can. It doesn't take a lot to secure a tomb. I mean, there's already a stone that's rolled in front of it. And now there's guards. I don't know, but this guy, Pilate, has always intrigued me a bit. As someone who had a level of insight into the, the person of Jesus... That, that fell just short of, of repentance and faith, but someone who, who had some recognition of the power that was at work within him. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but when I hear Pilate say, go make it as secure as you can, I think of someone who, who knows this is a futile effort. They are, are, are simply um, denying the inevitable. And so, 
once the tomb is empty, they begin saying, they knocked out the guards or the guards were asleep or guards weren't looking and they stole him away. And that story was circulated for some decades, even up until the time Matthew was writing. And you will still find people today who believe that the tomb was empty because people stole his grave. But the question then is, what did Jesus' disciples have to gain from such a prank? The gospel accounts do not portray their response to the empty tomb positively. I would encourage you to read each of the resurrection accounts, bearing in mind that they are spoken, by, uh, they are recorded by different people from distinctly different vantage points. For example, Matthew records from where he would have been staying in Bethany, and he records things as he sees them. John, on the other hand, records from his perspective in Jerusalem. And he records things as he would perceive them. Sometimes people read the resurrection accounts and they say they're so different. Well, that makes sense because one is different people and they're in different places and they're seeing different events. They never set out to record every detail or even the precise order of everything that happened. They also do something called telescoping, which is where they take a big story over days, Matthew in this case, 40 days, and condense it so that people get the core of the story. Read, read those resurrection accounts with those facts in mind, and you will see chaos. There are multiple overlapping visits to the tomb by groups of disciples. And it's, you know, some, some of these groups are, are groups of women and they're running this way and they're running that way. They're unbelieving. From the other gospel accounts, from what we understand is that the ladies are headed to the, the tomb and, and they're go, as they're going to the tomb, the, um, the, the, they see the stone rolled away in the distance. Mary Magdalene doesn't even wait. She sees that the stone is rolled away and then runs and tells Peter and John and says, we don't know where they laid him. The other ladies carried on and they go in and it is to those ladies that the angel now speaks and says he is risen. But each gospel account read on its own simplistically through, uh, you know, uh, as though it's chronologically complete, you'll think, oh, this is a very simple story. There's not a lot going on. But when you combine them together, you see how out of their minds they were with this fact of the empty tomb. If it was a self-serving prank fashioned to bolster the image of Jesus' disciples to lend them greater authority or credibility, would they not be portrayed more positively? With more faith? With more belief? Jesus had said, You will tear down this temple and in three days I will raise it again. Had they not believed? Even the Jews here knew that he had said he would rise from the dead. And that's why they anticipate the the emptiness of the tomb and set a guard to try and prevent it. But the disciples act like this is all news to them. They don't understand. They don't get it. They don't see it. Surely, if this was a a prank, it would have to serve a self-serving purpose and therefore the story would be dressed up to make them look good. Instead, we, we see chaotic, confused, unbelieving people. And add to that just a fact of the first century, women's testimonies were considered basically inadmissible in a court of law. I won't read to you all of the reasons why that were recorded by the historians of that day, but they were considered to be so emotional as to be utterly useless before a courtroom. 
Why then do all of the gospel accounts, including the one we've just read, tell us that the first people to discover the empty tomb were women? You even see it in the reaction elsewhere. Um, When the women go to the disciples, they don't believe. It says they thought it was an idle tale. Ah, silly women. You know, not very nice. Sorry, ladies, but that was the attitude. If this was a prank, if this was a hoax, it's certainly badly executed, and it's not at all clear as to why. Now, there are other hypotheses that people have proposed over the centuries. Some say that Jesus was not actually dead. That the, 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 you know, that the torture and the flogging and the cross bearing and the crucifixion itself um, did not kill him. But the reality is all of that never in history produced half dead people who after days in a cold tomb with no food or water suddenly are restored to health. The idea that Jesus was not dead is not at all entertained even by his enemies. They know he is dead. They say they've taken his body. Some say that the disciples were hallucinating. But if so, this makes no sense of the empty tomb. The flesh and blood reality that they testified to. The 40 days prolonged experience of hallucination, if that's what it was. Or the mass numbers who would have had to share simultaneously in this hallucination. We read at the beginning of the service that Jesus appeared to 500 people in one place at the same time. Most of whom were alive when Paul was writing that. The possibility that the grief-stricken disciples were hallucinating is not considered by Jesus' enemies. Mere hallucination would have been easy to prove by a simple visit to the tomb. You're hallucinating. Here's his tomb. Let's roll back the stone. Here's his body. But there was nothing in the tomb. And there was no stone in front of it. Some say, grasping quite desperately, that they just went to the wrong tomb. This idea is so childishly simplistic as to be absurd. What of the testimony of the soldiers? The rumor circulated by the priests. And again, the personal experiences of the risen Lord. Did everyone, including Jesus' enemies, get the tomb wrong? The, The powers that be in Jerusalem said, go, guard that tomb, make it as secure as you can. I think they knew which tomb they were guarding. And I think they were very well aware of of which tomb from which the stone was rolled away. In which the the grave clothes lay over to the side and were neatly folded. Outside of these often atheistic proposals are some theistic theories. Outside the boundaries of essential biblical belief and Christian orthodoxy. There's the Islamic scholars, for example, who present at least three different beliefs about Isa, but none of them, in none of them, does he experience literal, bodily, personal death, burial, and resurrection. Surah 4 in the Quran denies that Jesus was killed and that he was crucified. It says, basically, that he was simply brought to heaven. And then there's the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now to be seen outside every major transportation hub in the city and across our high roads. And they likewise deny the resurrection of Jesus as depicted in Scripture. I mean, they do talk about resurrection. Don't get me wrong. They even talk about Jesus 
being risen. One article entitled The Resurrection of Jesus Christ, Did It Really Happen?, repeatedly affirms the biblical statement that Christ is risen. But they don't mean what you and I mean, or at least what I mean, and what the Bible means. When we say Christ the Lord is risen. In one of their documents, You Can Live Forever on Paradise Earth, They claim that Jesus did not rise from the dead bodily or physically in the same body he died in. But his resurrection is merely spiritual. They refer to his risen form as a spiritual son. And he merely projects physical forms of himself. Both the Islamic and the Jehovah's Witness understandings are rooted in the ancient heresy of Gnosticism, which belittles the body, which says the material is rubbish, and this is a prison, and you have to be freed from it. This is inherently, intrinsically dirty. And so they cannot conceive of a risen Savior who comes back with the body like you and me. In the same way that they cannot conceive of God taking up human flesh in the incarnation. But we believe that Jesus is risen literally, bodily, because that's what the Bible tells us. One does not have a dead Jesus to raise. One does not see why Jesus would retain his human body when he's raised. But the Jesus of the Bible gives us a risen Jesus, one who is risen indeed to redeem humanity right down to the very flesh, the bones and blood of his being to the glory of God. In the text that we read, we see no alternative to the empty tomb other than then his body is stolen or Jesus is risen. That's what you have to choose from. It's man's prank or it's God's power. The only biblical alternative to the empty tomb being man's prank is that it is in fact God's power. There are only these two options. The body was stolen or Jesus is risen. To say that Jesus' body was stolen defies evidence. Even atheists have been baffled by the resurrection accounts because they will attest. And some of them will even, have even become Christians in doing this study. They will attest that the evidence points to a risen Savior. One defies evidence. The other defies experience. But this is the very essence of faith. Faith is the conviction and assurance of things that are out of our sight and beyond the rational comprehension of our mind. But to which all of the evidence nevertheless points. And this day... I must affirm yet again in the strongest possible terms that Jesus is literally bodily risen from the dead according to the power of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Ours is the message which is here. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come see the place where he lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. Ours is the message of Peter who denied Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, God raised him up having released him from the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held in its power. Ours is the message of Paul in his letter to the Romans that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord.
Ours is the message of Jesus Himself who said, This is why the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life so that I will take it up again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down of my own free will. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it back again. Jesus is risen according to the power of God. So it doesn't matter to the gospel writers in a sexist, discriminatory time whether the witnesses were men or women. Jesus is risen according to the power of God. So it doesn't matter if those closest to Jesus are portrayed in a somewhat negative light in the lead up to the crucifixion and in an unbelieving light as they grapple with the news of the resurrection. These excited women run back with joy and say, Jesus is risen. And they laugh and they say, what a cruel thing to say. It's an idle tale. Silly women, be quiet. But it doesn't matter. They learn that Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen according to the power of God. So it doesn't matter. In an age of Greco-Roman, anti-supernatural, philosophical enlightenment, or indeed in our own age of skepticism, if supernatural earthquakes, angelic beings, and the resurrection of a brutally killed dead man are outside of our experience. Jesus is risen according to the power of God. So it's only natural that the initial response is one of total confusion and chaos, disbelief, and even the mind boggles, but later when they see Jesus, even then, lingering doubt. Jesus is risen according to the power of God. So it is the only explanation that makes sense for the sudden courage and boldness of previously terrified, grieving disciples. Their steadfastness to death under violent persecution. Their explosive growth in mere decades as thousands came to believe in the risen Jesus Christ and the conversion even of arch enemies of Christianity like Saul, also called Paul, who wrote a massive chunk of the New Testaments that you hold today. Jesus is risen according to the power of God. It's actually the only thing that makes sense. And so what happened? Meanwhile, as the Jews are circulating this story about the disciples, also Jews, sealing the body of Jesus outside of the tomb, eleven disciples joined by others not mentioned spend their days around the city of Jerusalem and then on the road to Galilee and then in Galilee, 40 days interacting, eating, drinking, talking with the resurrected Jesus Christ. It is as the angel said, He is risen And you will see him. And saw him they did. Verse 16. I refrain from reading from that verse. But I will now. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee. To the mountain. To which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him. They worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples 
of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The resurrection says, no, it it triumphantly shouts to all of those who believe, to all of those who follow the way of the risen Jesus, do not be afraid. This was what the angels told the women in the tomb. Do not be afraid. This is what Jesus told the disciples, the women and the other disciples when they saw him each time. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Why should I not be afraid? There's so much in this this dark world to fear. Do not be afraid because you will see Jesus. That's what the angel said. You will see him. That's what Jesus said when they saw him on the road. You will see me. Do not be afraid because you will see Jesus. And you don't need to be afraid of his judgment when you see him. Because if you are trusting in Jesus, you can know that Jesus paid your debt. And He forgives you if you trust in Him. And so He does not look at you when you see Him in judgment, but He looks at you in compassion and love and forgiveness and He welcomes you into His family. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because Jesus is King. He says all authority, not some authority, all authority in heaven, the dwelling place of God and on earth, the dwelling place of man, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Jesus is king over all, even of death, the grave and hell. He has conquered all. And you are right to be afraid if you do not recognize Jesus as your king or if you do not give him your allegiance because power like that is power you don't mess with. But if you trust in him, he welcomes you as blessed citizens of his kingdom. Don't be afraid because your king is also your brother. Your king is also your savior. Your king is the husband of this, the bride, the church. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid because Jesus is with you always. All time, all space is encompassed by his sovereign omnipresence, his all presentness. And there is no darkness deep enough that he cannot see and know. And there is no problem that you face which is beyond his power. Wherever your journey takes you, he is with you to the ends of the earth. Whatever the span of your life, he's sticking around to the end of this age. Trust in him and don't be afraid. Sometimes we look around us at the suffering in the world and, and, and believers have looked at the suffering in the world. And like the disciples who saw the risen Savior and still some doubted. Christians, believers, down through the ages have doubted. Jeremiah, weeping, where are you God? I've seen affliction. Where is my hope? Habakkuk, why can you, O God, whose eyes are too pure to even look at evil, why do you tolerate suffering in this world? The disciples, seeing the risen Jesus, and there's nail prints in his wrists. And there's a hole in his side. And he's walking around talking with them. And they're like, 
what is this? What what suffering? I read this week where someone once said, if I had God's power for a day, I would make some changes. But if God gave me all of his power and all of his wisdom, I would keep things just the way they are. God knows what he's doing. God knows why he's doing it. God is with us in Jesus Christ. And we can live this life fearless of death. The hymn writer said, Jesus lives and so shall I. Death, your sting is gone forever. He who came for me to die lives the chains of death to sever. So you don't have to be afraid of death. He shall raise me with the just. Jesus is my hope and trust. Jesus lives and God extends grace to each returning sinner. Rebels he receives as friends and exalts to highest honor. So you don't have to be afraid of the judgment if you trust in him. Because God is merciful and just. Jesus is my hope and trust. Jesus lives and I am sure nothing from his arms can take me. Satan's threats I may ignore, nor let pain or pleasure shake me. So you don't have to be afraid of the temptations and the trials of this life because none of all of His saints is lost. Jesus is my hope and trust. Jesus lives and death's dark gate is my entrance into glory. Courage then, my soul and wait. Joy shall crown life's varied story. All God's ways are right and just. Jesus, still my hope and trust. Is He your hope and trust? Are you believing in the risen Jesus who gives His people an inconquerable faith and an unwavering love? Are you trusting in Jesus who even when our faith seems like it's failing and even when our our love seems like it's flagging, He holds us and He helps us and He ushers us home to the end. He has all authority. He's with us even to the end of the age. Why would you not Trust in Him.